I just was trying to explain that obviously as a public company, I can only share with you anything in the public domain. Um, so all the slides are based on our half-year results. Um, our full-year results come out next week, so I will be able to send you the updated information based on the latest data um, after we announce on Tuesday, so sort of Wednesday. Um, and that will have some up-to-date data in it. Um, albeit fundamentally things are very similar. Um, but uh, I can't share that information with you at this point. Okay, so John, what, what students want here is a, a real sort of overview of the health and fitness um, market and then an insight into sort of what makes the gym group, uh, how does the gym group differentiate itself? Okay, so um, if we go to the first of the slides, um, which really covers the sort of size of the market. And it is worth um, looking at the leisure database report that covers the whole of the sector, both public centers, um, the sort of private health club market, and obviously the local sector as well. Um, so it's the most comprehensive report on the market. And the latest the figures that I'm going to go through with you are based on last year's report. There is a new report that comes out in April, uh, which will be you know, the most up-to-date um, uh, information on the sector. The reason it's such a good report is it's commissioned by Sport England, and they carry out detailed research on any leisure operation in the whole of the UK. So. It is a very comprehensive piece of research. So looking at the first slide, um, the health club market in the UK is a very fragmented market worth about 4.4 billion. And um, as at the last report, there were 6,435 gyms in the UK. Um, the low cost market is the fastest growing part of that segment, uh, showing about 40% CAGA growth. Um, and that's very much sort of driving the market. Um, and there's a significant opportunity uh, for further growth in the UK, uh, as, as has become the case, uh, particularly in America, Germany, Scandinavia, where the low-cost market is creating a new market. So Planet Fitness in America recently announced that 43% of their members had never been in a gym in their lives before. So Planet Fitness are the world's biggest low-cost chain. Um, our percentage in the UK is currently uh, over 35%. Um, and in our older gyms, it's interesting uh, that that new market is being driven even into our oldest sites. So Hounslow, which is our oldest gym, um, had 41% of the people joining in 2016 told us they'd never been in the gym in their lives before. So next slide shows that fragmented market. Um, and the market is basically split. Um, approximately half of the market is the local authority market, albeit that market is reducing and my guess is the new report will show that continue. So last year was the first year that the, the size of the local of the um, local authority market had reduced in size and you are seeing some new factors driving that. So for instance Manchester announced recently that its leisure budget was being cut by 30 million pounds. So my guess is over time you will see a reduction in, in the local authority market. The rest of the market, as I said, is very fragmented. Only about 20% of the whole market are represented by the larger chains, low-cost chains, but people like David Lloyd, uh, Virgin, um, etc. And the low-cost market at the moment is relatively small. Um, at April, 
uh, that there were 450 low cost gyms, and according to our calculations, that has moved to oh, just over 500 low cost gyms in the UK. If you looked at this chart in more mature low cost markets, about half the market would be low cost. So if you looked at Germany, uh, Scandinavia, and um, other parts of the world, low cost that has been in those markets for a longer period represents about half the market. And you can see on the bar charts the impact of low cost. So the key message is the traditional health club market fundamentally um, is stagnant and all the growth both in terms of numbers of sites and um, members more particularly are, are coming from the local sector. So ju just as you're seeing in the airline market, as you're seeing in the hotel market and the retail market, the local sector is driving the bulk of the growth. So if you then move to the next slide, um, really the, what, what's that showing is what, what's the difference between low cost and the traditional market? And the key to it, just like with EasyJet or Ryanair or Lidl or Audi or Premier Inn is, 70, according to the 2016 Mintel report, 70% of people who use health clubs or sports centers only ever use gym equipment. So that is fundamentally our focus. So we provide a facility that is focused on what the majority of people want, and then we open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and there is no membership contract. So you can join for as long as you like. It's a very consumer-driven proposition as are low-cost airlines. What we don't have is the expensive to provide and not very often used facilities, which is it's not because we don't like indoor tennis or swimming pools, it's just they're expensive to provide and they are very low utilization facilities. Um, so if you looked at the whole market, set, as I said, 70% of the usage is in the gym, so that's what we do. Um, the rest of the 30%, um, swimming is second, classes are third, um, and the 2016 Mintel report probably is a very good source for that information. Next slide looks at the low-cost sector as a whole, and I suppose our main message here is there are three players pulling away from the rest of the market. So if you looked at it's exactly like low-cost airlines and low-cost retailers and so on. There are clearly more than one player, but ourselves, Pure Gym and Exercise for Less are um, expanding far faster than any of the rest of the market. And if you looked at most of the other low-cost operators below the dotted box, they haven't moved very much in the last 12 months. They may have opened one or two gyms, you know, we opened 15 gyms last year, um, and we've already exchanged on 17 openings for 2017. So we're expanding at a far faster rate than the rest of the market. John, can I just chip in with a question there, which sort of ties in with that? Um, so unlike some of your competitors, the gym is focused on organic growth. What are the key reasons for this, rather than looking at sort of the takeover merger model? Um, you, you show a greater return at the moment. Um, so if, I mean, it's, it's pure, straightforward economics. So um, why would I want to pay a premium for an existing operation um, when I can fit a gym out for between 1.3 and 1.4 million? And okay. I can, within two years, show in excess of a 30% return on capital. So it's purely economics that are driving it. If I played an eight times multiple of a, an existing gym, um, you know, it would be costing me three or four million. So 
while there is a significant growth opportunity in the UK, which there is, um, I mean, all the market research suggests there could be over a thousand low cost gyms in the UK. There are less than 500 as we speak. So that's what drives us. Why, why would I want to pay more than I need to? That may change over time, of course, but at this particular moment in time, our focus is totally on organic growth. Albeit, we will take a lease from a landlord. So we recently announced we'd acquired four fitness first sites, but we didn't pay a premium. We just took over the existing lease, and then we've subsequently converted those sites into one of our gyms. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, as I said, the, the three main players are pulling away from the rest of the marketplace. Um, if you then look at the next um, slide, it, it really shows the sort of history of, of the um, the gym group's growth. So we opened our first site in 2008. I remember well being in a freezing porter cabin in, outside a 24-hour Asda in Hounslow. Um, three months after opening the, the sales office, we opened with over 6,000 members. Um, and that was the first of, of our low-cost gyms. Prior to that, we'd done a lot of research into the low-cost market in other countries like Germany and America. Um, and, and that is why, if you visit any of our gyms, you will see exactly the same product. Um, it, the product is evolving all the time, but it is, a, is only evolving. Um, you can then see the growth, which has been funded largely by private equity. Um, that took us to 80 gyms at the half year. Um, we reached 89 gyms by the end of the year. Um, and we're guiding the market to us opening about 15 to 20 gyms a year. And as I said earlier, we've already exchanged on 17 gyms for 2017. That is driving high membership growth. Um, so we're nearly, you know, we're nearing on half a million members now. Um, and you can then see the subsequent high returns that we're achieving, um, both in terms of revenue, um, group EBITDA, um, which are all being driven fundamentally from membership growth. Um, if we then possibly move on two slides rather than just one, I'm not, unless there's anything anybody particularly wants me to cover, um, it's probably worth then looking at the sort of spread of our gyms. Um, as I said, this was this is a, the half year, so we're very much a national business. Um, we we have 34 gyms within the M25. That is just driven by the volume of population within that belt. But we are in fundamentally every major city in the UK, um, from sort of Glasgow, Edinburgh in the north, to um, Newport in the, in the west, Norwich in the east, Brighton in the south. Um, and we have a slightly stronger southern focus, just purely because of the where the density of population is in the UK. One of the key drivers behind our business is, is the fact we can convert a vast variety of buildings. So we've converted other gyms, we've converted a nightclub, a casino, office space, retail space. Uh, for instance, we've just done a conversion of three Sainsbury's where We've taken part of the Sainsbury's store um, and created one of our gyms in it with a separate entrance. But where both businesses benefit from our very strong footfall. Um, so our gyms can create up to 2,000 visitors a day. Um, 
and that is very attractive obviously to the retail operator because those people potentially spend money in their stores as well. So it's a very flexible business. Um, the product is identical, but we can use it in all sorts of different types of buildings. And this chart just shows you some examples. Glasgow, we opened in office space. Um, Norwich was um, a conversion of a new, in, a, in a new build situation. Tooting was a mixed um, leisure development along with um, housing. Um, Southfield was another new build situation. Uh, Southall was converted office space. So that's a very common sort of picture of the sort of premises that we're using. So we're much more flexible than the traditional health club market. We do not need a bespoke building. Okay, just on just on this uh, subject of, of location here, we have a question from Mark Mitchell, um, and, and he'd like to know, John, are there any plans to expand overseas, uh, and what do you see the challenges are for this? Um, it, it's not in our immediate focus, as as I said. I mean, the, all the research has done has suggested that you know we could have 250 gyms or thereabouts over the coming years, and obviously at 20 gyms a year that will take us some while to achieve. Um, so our big focus is expansion in the UK. However, there are clearly market opportunities in Europe. Um, they are. It is something that we were looking at prior to us floating on the stock market. Um, and it is something that we will return to. Um, it's not likely to be 2017, but it could be any time thereafter. In terms of challenges, I mean, it is something we've done a lot of research on. One of the key benefits of us moving into Europe, which is interesting with uh, the Brexit situation, um, is that you, ha you now have a common banking system. And so, f I mean, obviously, the, our key part of our business is collecting funds from members. And the process is identical wherever in Europe you operate. So it doesn't matter whether it's Germany, Scandinavia, Portugal, Spain, you know, they all use um, the same banking systems. Um, clearly, as, as is often the case with Ledger, there are some cultural differences. Um, and my guess is we're likely to choose markets where um, online businesses are strong. Um, so my guess is you won't see us going into a market, for instance, where Amazon isn't successful, because over 90% of our members join online. Um, so we are f fundamentally an online business. So you know, we're not likely to go to a market where you know, the internet is poor and where there isn't an online culture. Um, if you then look at the, the, the next slide, I mean, I've really covered, you know, we're looking at opening 15 to 20 gyms a year. I mean, obviously, one of the key factors in is, is putting together a team that's going to drive that. So over time, we've strengthened our team. Uh, we have a very strong property team, operational team. I mean, you know, we opened three gyms in one week last year, which I think is testament to our ability to uh, deliver consistently quality openings. And one of the benefits of floating for us has been that um, we've paid down a lot of debt. Uh, the business used to have borrowings of 40 million. Uh, today, those borrowing levels are about 5 million. Um, and a lot of the proceeds from the IPO were used to pay down that. We now don't lease our gym equipment, for instance. We, we own it all. Um, and that gives us a very strong balance sheet, which means we have the strongest covenant in the health club sector, uh, which is very important when we're negotiating with landlords. Um, 
Moving to the next slide, um, this really shows the economics of, of our sites, which are incredibly consistent. So these are average figures um, for all of our gyms that have been open uh, for more than two years. So it's about two-thirds of the estate. The rest of the estate is, as we would call it, immature at the moment. So on average, we're delivering uh, revenues in excess of a million pounds. We're producing EBITDA of uh, just short of half a million a site. Um, our fit-out costs have come down as we buy better as we get bigger. So we used to spend about one and a half million on the site. Today we spend about 1.35 million. Um, and the biggest driver for us is return on capital. Um, so we're currently showing, as you can see, over 30% return on capital. Um, in terms of the metrics, what does that mean? Well, we're very good at marketing and pre-selling membership. So our gyms typically open, on average, again, over, with over 3,000 members. And a, a standard site moves to around 6,000 members over the first two years of opening. So we have a very strong marketing team, a very strong pre-opening team that drives those results on a very consistent basis. Um, and then if you look at the profit profile, that just tracks the membership. So our pre-opening cost causes us to, um, we only, we move into it on, I mean, we break even within three months of opening, uh, which is quite extraordinary for a leisure business. Um, <clears throat> and we then move to profitability very quickly, achieving you know, between 450 and 500,000 EBITDA on average within the first two years of operation. Okay, uh, John, can I just chip in with some questions here from our uh, audience? Uh, this question here from, is from Darren, uh, Darren Knight. Um, he said, what is the demographic of new customers into the gym market? The gym market as a whole or just our market? Because they're quite different. Uh, yeah, the low-cost market. Okay, so I mean the market as a whole, the traditional health club market has been in the past very elitist, um, largely because of the price point. So the low cost market spreads right across the social spectrum, partly driven by price. So you know our average membership across the whole, whole UK, including London, is seventeen pounds a month, which is well under half of any of the traditional sort of operators, um, and in some cases a lot less than that. That's driving a social demographic right across the social spectrum. And it is the advantage with a low cost gym, it is classless. I mean, to be honest, if you're in kit, running on a treadmill, do you really care whether the guy next to you is on benefit or a multi-millionaire? And that's what our client, it's just like sitting on a plane, you know, an easy jet plane, the guy next to you could be anybody, and, and that's a classless environment that we've created. So it's a, demographically, it's much wider. As I said earlier, over a third of our members are, are first-time users. That's partly driven by price, but it's also driven by our 24-7 environment. So in a lot of our gyms, about 15% of our 15, one five, percent of our usage comes after 10 o'clock at night and before 6 a.m. And that is the shift workers, doctors, nurses, bus drivers, people who work in casinos or hotels or whatever it is, who don't necessarily want to operate on a Monday to Friday 9 to 5 basis. So the 24-7 operational side is driving a very different usage pattern. And that gives us much more even usage patterns right through the day. Um, so a traditional gym, for instance, at three o'clock in the afternoon would be empty. Our gyms will be full because we'll have shift workers or 
you know, taxi drivers who've got some time before they, um, you know, go on the road at six o'clock in the evening. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we have a question here from uh, Harris. Is the competition in the low cost market more competitive than the high cost market? Is it is it more competitive? Yes. Funda fundamentally, what's happening to the market is very much the same as other other uh, markets where low cost has entered it. So, if you took the hotel market, um, you tend to find the uh, premium end of the market is trading well um, and expanding, albeit slowly. And all the growth is coming from the likes of Premier Inn and Travel Lodge and so on. The, the low-cost health, the health club market is exactly the same. Um, you know, the likes of David Lloyd, Third Space, some of the boutique products are doing well at the premium end of the market, but but are much 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 smaller than the local sector. Um, all the growth, as I said earlier on, and you can see in the uh, graphs is being driven by low cost and the mid market is being crushed in between um, mm -hmm. and you've seen LA Fitness, Fitness First being broken up and sold because of that pressure between the low cost market and the premium end of the market. Okay, thanks, thanks for that John. We'll move on to the next uh, slide. Yeah. So the next slide shows a sort of trajectory. So our growth in EBITDA, it's a very simple slide this, is driven by three factors. First of all, our mature gyms, so the gyms that we've had open for more than two years. Um, we then got our new gyms opening, so the 15 to 20 gyms were opening um, a year that have been open less than two years, but they're maturing all the time. And then you've got the new gyms that we've just recently opened. So, very simple slide, but it shows what our business is all about. Okay, so we have a question here, uh, John, relating to location. How do you choose the location of this new gym, and are competitors' location important to this decision? Um, <clears throat> we we have a very diligent process to looking at sites. Um, in fact, we did a calculation the other day. For every site we do, we turn down 30 sites. Um, and I think that's testament to the fact that we're very focused on quality of growth. So uh, we have a property department. We use um, detailed um, CACI analysis process that looks at, first of all, the um, the volume and type of demographic profile uh, within us, generally speaking, within a three to five mile radius of each of a potential site. So that's the starting point. If there aren't enough people, we won't do the site. Um, then it, it revolves around the, the economics of the building itself. Um, so you know, is, does the rental fit within our sort of economic profile? If it doesn't, we won't do the site. We won't overpay for rental. And then it's the building itself. Does it, is, is it the right size? Um, is it, we, we generally speaking won't do a gym unless it's on one or two floors only. Um, we're looking for about 15,000 square foot of space. Um, outside central London, car parking, generally speaking, is vital, or the big cities. So certainly if it's in a residential area or it's outside the city centre, um, if it hasn't got good car parking, we won't do the site. Um, and then we're looking at other things like, you know, is the signage opportunity good? 20% of our members tell us they come as a result of having seen our signage. So. You know, we know that signage is important. All of these factors will be considered. Um, we give a sort of, sort of, well, a score out of ten for um, its eight different demographic um, and site analysis. 
Um, and then that then goes, if, if a site meets all of the criteria we're looking for, um, and that's why we turn down 30 out of every 31 we look at, uh, it then goes to our board for sign-off. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, so we can take a look now um, at sort of the major influences on, on growth and the, and the tre um, changing trends. John, what would you consider have been the most important, most significant influences that have driven uh, growth in the UK health and fitness market? Um, well, what we're seeing at the moment, I mean, if you, in fact, it was one of the slides I think I sent you, but um, it, if you go back to 2007, the health club market in the UK had become very stagnant, as I said earlier. Um, then local, I mean, we opened our first low, low cost gym in 2008. So that graph shows how penetration has moved from about 7% of the, this is in terms of private health clubs, from about 7% up to 9 and this is where we see a lot of growth potential. So the vast majority of the population at this moment in time don't use health clubs. Whereas in more mature low cost markets like Germany, Scandinavia, etc., cetera, um, nearly 50% of a particular market can actually be members of, of a gym and the majority of them will be members of low cost gyms. So, there is a lot of significant growth potential in the market, um, which, which is clearly what's driving the sort of low cost demand. Okay. Um, I have a great question here from uh, Ian Pryor. So to what extent is technology a tool weapon for low cost gyms? And to what extent is it a, a threat, for example, the DIY fitness tools like Strava, etc., for running and cycling? I mean, technology is vital to our business. Um, you know, we're, um, I mean, we were the first operator to introduce online joining, 24-7 operation, um, a very radical way to running a gym. So if you took a traditional gym, they spend about 30% of their um, turnover on staffing um, because of the way we use technology. Um, our, our equivalent percentage is less than 6%. So it is just fundamentally a very different business. My guess is, I mean, even down to we use technology to design our gyms. So um, we put motion sensors on every single piece of gym equipment to test the usage patterns, how the equipment's being used, who's using it, what time of day they use it, and so on and so forth. And we actually use that data to physically design our gyms. And it enables us to react to trend changes. So, for instance, we're seeing a lot more interest in functional training at the moment. We're seeing a lot more interest in the use of free, light free weight training, particularly among the female market. And we reflect that data in redesigning our gyms or when we're refurbishing the gym at every um, we, we refurbish every five years so we will look at that data and use that to you know revamp a gym every five years I think mm -hmm. looking forward technology I think it will be huge I mean we've seen obviously things like Apple watches and Fitbit um, the big growth area for us at the moment is how people monitor their exercise a, in our gyms, but also when they're outside the gyms um, because people want to be able to go for a run or stop on a bike ride or go for a swim. Um, they don't necessarily do that in our gym, but they still want to be able to monitor it. So we're introducing technology that will enable our members to do that, which should help us continue to differentiate ourselves from particularly the traditional market. Okay, thank you. So, what what trends do you think um, you feel are likely to have the biggest negative impact on gym membership? Which ones are you aware of or, or thought of? 
I don't, I'm not sure that there are. I, I mean, I see new innovation coming into the market, and I know I was talking the other day to the CEO of uh, Planet Fitness in America, and saying, you know, what impact does Soul Cycle, for instance, have on him? And he says it's great because it's just growing the market. We're just getting more people exercising, um, and you know, people, you know, will join our gyms, and and they'll also use Soul Cycle. Um, you know, they're totally different products, um, but the very fact that people are doing both is, is, in my view, good for you know the industry as a whole. Um, so I don't see, I don't, we don't look at things like that. We don't sort of think boot camps are a threat to us. We see them more as a good thing because they'll introduce different people to a market, and some of those may join our gyms as well. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we can move on to the next slide, yeah. Um, so, I mean, really, the next slide really looks at the technology. So, I mean, we've covered some of this. So, the online joining process is, is key. So, in a traditional gym, most people join, they, you know, fills it, fill in forms and Somebody processes that information into a PC. Over 90% of our members join away from the gym online whenever it suits them. So that's a, you know just like you do with a low-cost um, airline or you know, low-cost hotel. So online is a critical part of it. Um, we use technology for our 24/7 access control system. So we have to clearly provide a safe environment for members, but we're using technology to, to drive that. Um, we've talked about how we use technology and equipment use. Um, it also results in us being an incredibly data-rich business because our CRM system is collecting all of the data all of the time. Um, so we know everything about our members, who they are, their demographic profile, what marketing they've responded to, how often they use our gyms, what time of day they use the gyms, and so on and so forth. So all of that, the data we collect um, is uh, collected electronically. And we then use that data to help us decide whether we do new sites or not. So for instance, there are eight uh, mosaic profiles we see consistently in our more successful gyms. So when we're looking in the for instance, a new site in Manchester, we know exactly where those mosaic profiles are in the Manchester area, and then we will be trying to find sites in those locations. So we, as we've said on the right, we use it for site selection. It helps with our marketing, um, you know, our equipment and layout. Um, technology is key to the engine experience itself and the way we operate. So. Um, Okay. The next slide um, is one we put in um, really for um, investors um, because one of the big concerns um, that they potentially have is what are the barriers to entry? What stops, um, as somebody horribly puts it, somebody eating our lunch? Um, so we see there are five major um, barriers to entry in the sector. Firstly, know-how and ex know-how and expertise. So we've had 80 years experience of building 89 successful gyms, and we've learned an awful lot through that process. You can learn it, but it, you can't learn it overnight, and therefore we you know, clearly have a march on the rest of the market. Uh, because of that know-how. Um, our ability to source sites, we have the best covenant strength. Um, we have a, an amazing property team who are spread throughout the UK and are constantly looking at new sites. Um, that's something you can replicate, but it takes time and you have to operate a number before you get the experience. Um, scale advantages is another big factor, so 
you know, we spend over six million a year on gym equipment, so unsurprisingly, we can buy gym equipment much cheaper than anybody else can. Um, so, and we apply that to everything we do, whether it's flooring or lockers or um, lighting or air conditioning and so on. So, scale advantages is another key um, factor. Access to capital, I mean, clearly we're a listed business now. Um, we're cash rich. Um, we're generating an awful lot of cash flow, which we plow back into new sites. Raising money, if you were starting a gym on your own to date, very difficult. Um, it took us three years before we were able to raise any bank debt of any description. So it, it can be achieved, but it takes time. And then technology, uh, we're investing a significant amount of money into technology. It's not easy for somebody to do that. And you cannot, uh, most of the software, for instance, we use is bespoke and we, we have actually written it ourselves. So it's not some, you know, most of our software you cannot just buy off a shelf. So we see all of those factors having an, in, an influence on barriers to entry. So we focus now on the facilities and services um, provided by private healthcare and fitness clubs. Um, I had a question for me prior earlier on. You sort of saw an article where you talked about filings for your product. Are you able to give some details of these new revenue streams that you are uh, exploring through these trial methods? Sorry, I'm sorry, I've lost that last part. Yes, um, we were just saying you, you, it was reported that you are uh, trialing new products. Um, yeah. Are you able to give us uh, details of, of these potential new revenue streams that you are? Uh, exploring. Yeah, I, be, I mean the way we see it is, it's well, sorry to use this sort of comparison with uh, EasyJet all the time, but it's it's a good comparison for us. So when um, EasyJet first started, their main focus was opening new routes, um, filling planes with people, and our focus over the last eight years has been opening new gyms um, and filling them with members, which clearly we'll continue to do. But clearly, there's an opportunity. I mean, we have a live database of, um, you know, over six million people. Um, you know, we had 21 million people visiting our gyms last year. So clearly, there's an opportunity for driving other f sources of revenue. So at the moment, that represents about two percent of our turnover. Um, mm -hmm. So things like vending, for instance. Um, but of course, what we're interested in is can we, you know, can we make that larger? So, you know, rather like EasyJet now, about 30% of their turnover comes from ancillary spend. So most of it is in the ancillary spend. It, it could be all sorts of things. Um, it's likely to be, and we're testing uh, a number of things as we speak. But it's likely to be something you do online because we very much see ourselves as an online business. So we're not likely to do the things that traditional health clubs do. Um, we won't have a shop or beauty therapy or something of that type. But what's much more likely is you know products and services that we can you know sell online to our members. The one area, for instance, we've been looking very closely at is providing. Uh, private health care for members. So uh, a lot of private health care providers, if you regularly exercise, they're prepared to give you significant discounts on um, health care schemes. So, you know, that, that's a clear benefit to our members, um, you know, if they're using our gyms on a regular basis. So it's that type of secondary spend. So it's the equivalent, it's, it's not the same, but um, Obviously, um, but it but it's likely to be sort of online driven. We've been looking, for instance, at a new drinks product um, that you know members will be able to sort of access if they wish. I mean, it's obviously um, completely voluntary. Um, and then the other one we're also seeing is as we get bigger, 
people want to be able to use more than one gym. So I think if you looked in, you know, when we had 10 gyms, about 2% of our members use more than one gym. Today that percentage is 13% and growing. Um, so we're able to offer a gym possibly near where you work, but also one near where you live, um, and therefore you can access more than one gym. So that's something we're looking at. We're also looking at enhancing membership categories. Um, so for instance, maybe a slightly enhanced membership that enables you to bring guests along free of charge, um, you know, get the drink product for free included, that type of thing. So you get rather like an EasyJet Plus card, giving people other mm -hmm. products and services um, all for a monthly amount. Okay, thank you. And um, we're getting quite a few questions. If we can just move on, uh, Jim, please. Okay, so that was section three. I think it's th that slide we've already covered in terms of, um, you know, what, what we don't do and what we do do um, in terms of low-cost environment. Um, I mean, we, the next slide is, is phot photographic. It just shows the cross-section of our gyms, um, you know, shows how we drive consistency wherever it is. Um, also, you can see there some of the innovation that we're testing, things like virtual classes. Uh, we introduced a while ago a, a new product called uh, a new product which is a virtual spinning environment um, that enables you to do spinning anytime you like, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, but you can do it when it suits you. You don't have to sit to a, um, a, a particular timetable. Um, okay, thank you. Now we're getting quite a few questions relating to um, HRM. You mentioned one of your slides there about how you operate a lean staffing uh, model. Could you just quickly describe, you talked about Hounslow earlier, um, what, what does the staffing model look like there in terms of the uh, number of employed staff compared to sort of the freelancers, uh, maybe gym instructors? Okay. Um, it, it's not so much the number of people, it's, it's the way we focus the staff. So first of all, we've removed a lot of staff intensive areas, uh, particularly behind the scenes, so administration, processing membership information, producing reports and so on and so forth, are just done automatically. We don't have anybody producing information. So that has made a radical difference to the sort of HR structure. If you look at the sort of key element of it, and, and this is used you know, very much internationally, um, and we don't make any bones about it, we borrowed it from the major German operator, um, is we have a manager and an assistant manager in every site, and then we have a team of about 12 to 14 personal trainers per site. Um, so they are um, reps level three qualified individuals. Uh, they may have a sports science degree, for instance, um, and they will work in our environment. We're very different to the rest of the market. So um, they don't pay rent. Um, we don't take a percentage of their turnover. But they're self-employed, and they what they do is they give us 10 hours of floor cover per week. And we use that time to fundamentally um, you know, cover inductions for new members, showing new members around. So those people can interact with, you know, the large membership base that we have um, and promote their personal site, uh, personal training services. So that's fundamentally how we staff every gym. I mean, obviously, we then have, you know, regional managers. We have you know, a head office structure, a finance team, an IT team, a property team, um, you know, obviously who are sort of more centrally based. Um, but the, the key to our operation is, 
you know, high quality, um, co well qualified people, and the, and a lot of a lot of our personal trainers then go on um, to become assistant managers, to become managers within our site. So, let me just give you um, one example. Um, James, who's our eSport manager, started with us on work experience. Uh, when he got finished getting his degree, he joined us as a personal trainer. Um, he worked in Crawley and in Vauxhall. Um, he then became an assistant manager. Uh, he then joined our management training program. Um, he then um, became a manager. He then very successfully launched our Eastbourne gym. Um, and I'm sure he's going to move on to other things. So they ultimately become a regional manager, and I could use that story on countless occasions of people who, because we're expanding so quickly, we have, you know, significant um, sort of career opportunities for people. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so just to, to 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 bring it all together, and we'll just open the uh, open the question up to to our audience in a moment. Um, so recently became a PLC. Um, looking at the flotation, was the pain worth the gain? <laughs> That's an interesting one. Um, uh, broadly speaking, yes. Um, it, floating on the stock market is not to be taken lightly. I mean, I have done it an, a number of times before. It's a very expensive process. Um, I mean, it you know. It cost us over six million pounds to float. Um, on the other hand, we raised 195 million in the market, so relatively speaking. But it, it's it's not for the faint-hearted. Um, it involves a very different working environment. So there's a lot of um, sort of governance around being a public company, um, you know, which is there to protect investors, quite rightly so. But nevertheless. It's you know very different from running a private, or particularly a privately owned company. Um, so you know there, there are, it, it's it's very different from a, a smaller company environment. Um, however, it, it, as we talked about it, um, it, it's given us a lot of help with uh, the covenant strength that we have in terms of acquiring new sites. And I think the, the probably the biggest benefit for us has been with our people, to be honest. Um, so everybody mm -hmm. who works for us is a shareholder. They all, you know, a yeah. little bit like John Lewis, you know, they all um, share in our success. Um, and, you know, that applies to everybody in the business. And they have the option, to, you know, to buy shares every year at a preferential price if they so wish to do so. Um, so certainly from that point of view, it, you know, and it, it, it has helped. I mean, we have unbelievably strong uh, retention of people. Um, part of it is because hopefully, I believe we manage our people very well, and um, you know, we treat them very well and we reward them properly. But the additional benefit is, you know, they are now owners, part owners of the company. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so we've just got five minutes uh, left now for further questions. I just want to, to uh, Mark Mitchell has come up with a superb question here. So we're open twenty, we're open twenty four hours, uh, seven days a week. Legally, must a gym be staffed twenty four hours? And what happens if someone has an accident at three a.m. on the treadmill? You, you can imagine I've been asked that question before. <laughs> I can. Um, it, it's, I mean, a, a, as a public company, we, we have to have very, very safe systems. So, first of all, um, every square inch of any of our gyms is covered 24-7. Um, technically, you don't have to be staffed 24-7, but we always have somebody in the building who is first aid trained. So, even our cleaners are first aid trained. We also, um, so that, that's a sort of key part of the operation. Um, 
I mean, our team cover the gym from 6 a.m. till 10 p.m. Um, and then the cleaners are in in the building overnight. Um, we have defibrillation in every single site. That's not an industry standard, but it is for us. Um, because we want to provide a completely safe environment for our members. Um, okay, if you were working out at 3 o'clock in the morning and there was nobody else in the gym at all, the moment you entered the gym and used your PIN number, that immediately sets off the, the CCTV system, uh, which is monitored um, at a central station. Um, the gym space is then monitored by CCTV. If you collapsed, um, I mean, there are help points throughout the gym, but if you collapse, for instance, we had a heart attack, um, the person would see you um, and they would immediately call, um, you, know, the uh, you know, the emergency services to get help. To be honest, I think a, a low-cost gym environment is a lot safer, um, if only because we cover every square inch of a building. Um, you know, that is not true in a sports centre, it's certainly not true in a, a racket centre. There are also all sorts of areas where if you collapsed, nobody would see you. Um, so we, we believe very strongly in having a very safe environment um, and we use people and technology to provide it. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I think that's all we've got time for. So. Uh, on behalf of uh, all the students out there and the teachers too, I think it's been there's been so much useful uh, material that they can use for their forthcoming exam. So huge thank you, John. Thank you so much for for being with us tonight, uh, and thank you to all the students and all the teachers for your questions. Uh, thank you very what much. I, what, I, what, I, what I will do is forward the um, the investor pack that I'm presenting next week to our investors, um, which then becomes a public document. So um, you can, um, and I can send you a copy of our annual report if that's of interest as well, which you can share with, with anybody because it's then a public document. Great stuff. We shall make that available um, through our sort of website and put it in the Dropbox folder as well, um, which is with our community. So. Uh, Thank you very much, and uh, to all of you out there, have a, a great night, and best of luck with your exams. Thanks all. Good luck, everyone.